Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Delang with Indiana Fashion Week. And so I have some really, really great things in store for you tonight. So we are going to be interviewing Mercedes Gonzalez. She is the author of Chronicles of a Fashion Buyer. And before I get into everything, what I'm going to do is do a few housekeeping things. I'm going to actually share the video now. So just hang tight with me. And I also want you to like share and also add your comments because you can also ask questions here and at the end we will go through the comments and pick some of them to answer so give me a second i'm going to hold on mercedes if you can too if you want to share the video and i'm going to share it and come back on and then we can get started and then in the meantime let me know what city state and country you're from we'd love to hear more um, about what you do and then also where you're from so definitely go ahead and add it in the comments below and i see that we have faith on thank you faith for watching and all right so i'm gonna share it again go from there great okay all right so Again, I'm Delane with the Indiana Fashion Foundation, and the Fashion Foundation is all about providing resources and opportunities for growth in the fashion industry. And one thing about Indiana is we have a thriving community, but not a whole lot of resources. And so let me know in the comments below, like what city, state, and country you're from. Like, do you have a lot of opportunities where you are? And maybe you're from a bigger city and you're like, oh, I'm this, you know, there's a lot of competition either way let me know um, what type of resources and opportunities you have but i know in indiana we need more so the indiana fashion foundation is all about bringing these resources so tonight we have mercedes gonzalez again the author of chronicles of a fashion buyer and she's going to share some things about the fashion industry and go more in detail so i know we have some people from new york on the line los angeles thank you tiffany for joining us and it's really important to create these conversations because I'm constantly hearing from other creators like there's not enough opportunity or I don't know a lot about the industry or, you know, who can I trust to help me with my line? And, you know, it's just really important to start this dialogue. So I'm excited that the Indiana Fashion Foundation is going to be able to bring these opportunities. And then, oh, so we have Ohio that's in the building. We have Indianapolis that's tuning in as well. So again, thank you. So I am, I'm excited. I'm excited. I love to read, right? But I like to read things that apply to the things that's going on in my life, right? And so I started designing when I was a kid. And then from meeting other entrepreneurs, I was like, listen, I need to create a show here in Indianapolis. So I produced my first show when I was 15 years old. And ever since then, I've been doing things that just help build the community. And so when I was googling because i was coming to new york i was like i gotta find somebody that can help me right maybe not in person but some video that can help me so when i was up at three o'clock in the morning trying to figure out my way through new york i found mercedes gonzalez and i instance instantly loved her approach because it was no nonsense you know it was it was opposite of what i was hearing it was I felt like she was really trying to share information and not hold anything back, but enough information to at least get me started. So when we decided to do Making It In Fashion, it's a series that we we produce each um, throughout the year. And we were like, we got to have Mercedes to come on and actually talk about the industry. So she is an international fashion strategist and she works with retailers and also emerging fashion designers to help them with actually strategizing on their business and their their platforms and she does things all over the world and also domestically so mercedes thank you so much for joining us this evening is there anything else you want to share about what you do before i get into the questions <laughs> Well, thank you, first of all, and I'm really honored to be here, and I'm so glad to be working with you and, and with uh, Indiana Fashion Week, and I think it is always a good opportunity. Um, you know, some people think that, oh, because I'm from New York City, that I'm not really that approachable, but at the end of the day, we're all in this business together, and that's why, actually, I started working, because our business really revolved around retail, opening up stores, you know, making sure that the retailers were competitive, and one of the advices that I gave from the very beginning is, in order to be competitive, 
you have to have different products. And mm -hmm. one of the ways to have different products is to support the local independent designer or the emerging designer or the new brand, right? And when I started to give this advice to my clients, they were all happy and they all kind of immediately jumped on the bandwagon. Where do I find them? How do I reach out to them? And then I started getting the complaints. Mm -hmm. They are a hot mess. That was like the best comment I got. They're I a hot mess. <laughs> they don't ship. They're overpriced. They don't know where they're buying their fabrics. Their construction is not consistent. And then I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to have to jump on the other side and start helping a little bit uh, these young designers because it, it really benefited us. As retailers, we need something new. You, you know, the, the excitement, the newness, the freshness, and the fact that it keeps us retailers competitive in the sense that you're a new guy. You're not going to be selling on Amazon. You're not going to be discounting at Marshalls. And that's why it's a really great opportunity and why we started working with the emerging designers. So the advice that you'll hear from me is very different than you'll hear from somebody that is really nurturing artists, that's really nurturing like a, a different kind of designer. And I always felt that that kind of designer doesn't pay the rent, either for the store or for themselves. So I'm more of the practical kind of, I, I guess if you want to call it consultant, which I, I have to tell you like something about me. I hate the word consultant. Mm -hmm. Consultant to me means two things. You don't have a job and you're calling yourself a consultant or as my husband put it to me when I first started the company 20 years ago, a consultant is a person that steals your watch and then charges you to tell you what time it is. Oh my goodness. And that's not me at all. Like if I tell you we're gonna do something, it's all about the execution. And I also like to teach from experience. So, you know, I worked with my uncle, as you probably read in the book, you yeah. know, I, I lived in China, I sold to Walmart, like those are not glamorous things, but I realized how much money there was to make in the business. And that experience also taught me a lot of things about operations, but, when you don't put your own money into something, you don't feel other people's pain. So the first brand that I launched was Dovetail, and you know it had its success, and it's still like up and running in its different formation now. M more recently, I started working with a t-shirt line because I absolutely hate t-shirts, and I keep saying that in all my work presentations, and I'm like, but everybody owns a t-shirt, everybody wears a t-shirt. Like, how do we make it better? How do we make it different? How do we make it our yeah. own? And I started working with photographers, with artists. This third collection that we have is actually with an artist too that did my book cover, who I feel is amazing. Yeah, um, yeah, she's just amazing. And then, so you know what the trick with the book cover? If I just give you a little insight, the front cover is me pretty recently, and the back cover is me my first trip to Hong Kong, and I'm wearing one of my uncle's polyester dresses. So I went from Walmart special. Gucci in ah! this kind of that book. I love that. Thank you for that intro tip. I love that. You're welcome. So I'm, I'm working with that. I'm working with Rose Hartman, who's 81 years old, um, young, and mm -hmm. taking like their art and their photography to a different level too. And we also worked with Leroy Henderson, which I want you to look him up because yeah. this man was like he was in the thick of the civil rights movement. There's beautiful pictures of him with uh, Dr. King. There's pictures with him with Muhammad Ali, like at his training camp. I don't know. Oh my God, it's just absolutely amazing. So we're taking this art and putting it on t-shirts. And you know, even in the case of Rose, she did so much more business selling a t-shirt, a high-end quality t-shirt, than she did selling her prints. Mm -hmm. So it is about being able to copy yourself before somebody else does. Mm, and that's interesting because that's actually one of the questions, like as a, a retailer or even like a retailer in other retail establishments, copying the type of things you have in your um, store or as a designer and someone copying, like how to protect yourself on that and how to just be, for me, I say first to market, <laughs> but right. how to protect yourself. Exactly. And you know, it's really interesting because this is what I think about it too. As a designer, I'm just going to be really frank. Mm hmm. Everything's been Love done. It. Everything's been done. Like it's been done. As wild as your idea you think it might be or avant-garde or different or new twist on it, it's been done. And as a matter of fact, one of my favorite new Instagram accounts is Diet Prada. Have you oh, been following them? Uh-uh. Oh know. my gosh, you have to follow them because Diet Prada. 
because okay. all they do is like they call it out like oh you think off white is so this or you think this guy you know riff uh simmons did a, a brand new collection and they called it out when he did his first collection after graduation so mm -hmm. it's really kind of funny how they they humble the designers but the only way that you could keep people from copying you because usually a copy is cheaper right right is to make something so extraordinary that you can't afford to copy it cheaper that's one and the second thing is learn to copy yourself like all the big brands do all the department stores do they have like the luxury brand and then they they water it down and they water it down through fabrications or making it more simple construction like there are ways to diffuse the collection so that you can afford to do that and as a retailer I'm going to tell you, and this is why it's so important that from the beginning, you're not working in your store because you always have to be out in the hunt. You always have to be looking for like the new brand, for the new designer, for the international brand. And how do we incorporate it? And how do we bring them together in our store to always keep it different? So yeah, somebody down the street might have your brand, but everybody in town is saying, yeah, I bought it at Mercedes store a year ago when she first found them. See. <laughs> And I love the way you said it because, like, it is about just stepping out there and doing it. Like you said, it was a year ago, like, stepping out there and doing it. And that's one thing I see that's holding a lot of the, you know, the the people who want to be in the fashion industry that I run across is just that that feeling of being scared and nervous and feeling like they don't have enough money or enough time. And what would you say to them who feel like they can't do it because they're just like they, they can't compete with these big designers? So, you know, to be honest with you, it's just like, I guess, having a baby, right? You never have enough time and you never have enough money. But if you don't just jump in and do it, you're never going to do it. And then you're going to be, and you know what? This is probably the most heartbreaking part of like my job is when I get a 70 year old woman or a, and this is a true story, a 78 year old man who has been walking around with a business plan and a portfolio and sketches since high school. And now they're like, well, you know, this is my last, you know, phase in life. And I really want, when those ideas were brilliant. So I wish I had a magic pill to give people enough bravery, but this is what I want you to use. That fear and that paranoia and that sense of anxiety all of those words we're taught are bad words and emotions that we don't want to experience. Mm -hmm. But if you actually think of them as positive, like, yeah, if you're paranoid that people are going to rip you off, you're going to be extra careful of who you talk to and how you execute your brand. If you feel anxiety, great. That is the universe giving you three more hours of not sleep so you can work on your project. Like, Definitely. embrace it. Embrace it. Work it to your advantage. But just don't... I, I feel like the biggest... Fear is not of losing money. I think the biggest fear is embarrassing yourself in front of your friends. Mm. And that's why I always joke about it, but it's not really joking. You have no friends because at the end of the day, the people that you would consider a friend are going to stick with you in good times and bad times and happiness and success and in failure. And if you actually look at every household designer name that you know, I most definitely can tell you a time where they were broke. Christian Louboutin, he tells a great story about how he had to live in the factory where they were making oh, the shoes because he couldn't afford rent. Isaac Mazzarai, how many times did he go out of business? Um, uh, Mark Jacobs, he said it took him only 20 years to become an overnight success. Like these are all people that stuck with the hustle. And again, mm -hmm. like when people ask me, like what, what really gives you the advantage of a designer? Is it talent? Is it money? And it's neither of them. I've worked with both types of people and the difference is hustle, that they don't give up. And I <laughs> promise you, all the people in the world that I have worked with that haven't continued, it's not because they had a bad experience or they were ridiculed or they had a horrible collection or a factory ripped them off or they ran out of money even. It's that they gave up. Yeah. I love the fact that you talk about like, the family and friends. And... I love it because you, you talk about it right in the book, even with the chapter about La Perla. You know, I might, you know, I might, I might say little things about the book, but I'm not going to give away things because you need the book, okay? <laughs> but the book is great. But even with that, it's like you have to put yourself in a position and in, in a in a surrounding where there's other people that know about the industry, 
you know, get a mentor that knows about it, that can actually help you, that's been there, done that recently. And I love the fact you said in the book, like recently, <laughs> you know, even though they did it in the past, still, you know, there's new and fresh things going on now. But it's like, if you're basing off your family and friends, that is not your target market. So can you expound more on that a little bit? Because I, I always hear that, like, my family, my friends are not supporting me. And it's like, they're not supporting or they're supporting you. They're not supporting. Like, they're not. So you know what? Do, that's actually good friends to have around. The negative Nellies and the naysayers and the angry mother and dad. Like, why can't you stick to a job? And like, that is great because it gives you perspective. I think it's worse when you have like an overly loving parent that every like crappy shit that you do, they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. You're so wonderful. You're because it's not practical. That's not the world. It's but not if you have that experience of parents like knocking you down every time, then you know how to fight and you know how to get in there and you know how to survive. And unfortunately, that's really what it takes. It takes a very, very focused determination. And it's almost like, I want to say, like, if I'm holding your head underwater and you can't breathe, that, like, anxiety that you have to pop your head out to breathe, that's the kind of passion, right. that angry passion that you need to have. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, if we go back to one of the stories where um, her real name is Megan, so now you won't know who it is in the story. I forgot what name I gave her. But if I tell you about Megan, like, she had money. Her father like, had just donated $20 million to the rainforest. Mm -hmm. She had, the, and to this day, she has really only been the, a designer that I can say was so curious and so different that I dare say she was a couture designer. I have never said that in my life. And I was so excited to meet, like, this could really be, like, the first American real, like, beautiful like elegant like detailed like gorgeous like delicious right designer mm -hmm. and here i am going to get the credit for discovering her right but the minute that we had that business meeting with her dad and we had to go over the plan you should have seen like she sat in this chair and she got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until like literally she disappeared and that's so how my father knew it and i knew it one bad review and she would have like jumped off the brooklyn bridge so it is a lot of it is personality and determination. But now I'm going to just jump. I'm sure you have a million questions for me. But no, go ahead. very recently, I've realized that a lot of people that feel like they're fashion designers are actually more merchants. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is that I feel like they would actually do better owning a retail store where they made like custom things for like an atelier which is very European and it's actually very old fashioned where you have the front of your store as a retail store, you carry some emerging brands because you want to be an advocate for them. Mm -hmm. You have some current brands that are easy sales and some margin builders, but then you have the atelier in the back where you're making things one of a kind things. You're making, you're updating somebody's old gown or a dress or you're, you're fitting a sizing or you're adding something and that gives you the creative energy that you crave as a designer that you're actually creating but you're also a merchant where the things that sell you're going to take and make better so i think when we look at the bigger picture it's really important right that's going all these different avenues so you don't have to just feel like you have to be like that head designer that you produce five you know so many collections a year and all this it's all about getting creative and that was gold with what she just said so i hope you caught that if you're an aspiring designer is another option for you so I, I did see a comment i wanted to make sure that we were um, clear about a few things so mercedes if you can tell them specifically who you target and but i want to say once she says that it's for me i feel like with, when you read the book is anybody that's in the fashion industry like you can learn like i was telling her this and let me tell you something like some people who haven't met me before i'm only gonna bring to you the things that like i really believe in and i'm fired up about so when I say that I like it, trust, okay? <laughs> but this is for something like, it's an MBA. Like I have my MBA. <laughs> and just reading the stories in here. So it, it literally, for me, I believe is for anybody in the fashion industry, but I know that Mercedes has a specific target. So Mercedes, Mercedes if you could talk about that, that way, because it was a couple questions in the thread. 
So, you know, I don't want to say like, look, we get big gigs. We work with international brands. We work with mall developers in many different countries, like trying to organize and merchandise the, the mall so that they're balanced. We've worked with some major retailers from Harrods in London, from Walmart in the United States. Those are all great jobs. We're really, really good at it. But again, like my side hustle, my passion is the independent entrepreneur, which so I love. I, honestly, I don't even care if you want like, you know, I, I live in upstate New York in a rural community and I love it when like the local farmer will say like, how do I make my jar of honey a little bit better? How do I get it to market? And I'm like, you know, I don't do honey, but the business process is the same. It's the same. So, yeah. How do we cookie cutter? How do we grow? How do we scale? That's a word that's really important. So if I had to tell you I had one target, it's a person that wants to make money. That is who I want to work with. Not the person that's running an art, uh, a hobby. Even like we started to work with some artists and I actually started to write a, a workshop called how not to be an artist mm. because it's yep. not about just a creative spirit, but how do we take that beautiful like photograph and how do we make it a t-shirt instead of selling one $9,000 print, right? We're selling 3000 $200 t-shirts. Yes. So, okay. I love the way you just said it. Cause I wanted to go back and talk about the whole thing that and you open up with this in your YouTube videos. So again, if you, when you get a chance, the viewers you're watching, check out Mercedes Gonzalez on YouTube, just Google that and you will find some really great videos. And so one thing you say often is, do you want to be rich or famous? And I and I and it was just we're playing in my head because if I could be just behind the scenes doing things like I love that, you know, but it's like in this new age, you almost have to be or they make you think you have to be, you know, in front of the camera doing live streams and spreading your message to like show your brand. So can you speak more on that? Like, do you want to be rich or famous? So I'm going to tell you a secret, right? That question is actually a trick question mm. because if you choose to be rich, you actually become famous. That's real. Yeah. So just think about Mark Zuckerberg. You would think that he ever wanted to be like famous. That was the last thing on his mind, you know, or, you know, Bill Gates. You think that he wanted to be um, famous? No, he couldn't care less about that, right? He wanted to be rich. So I feel like that question is actually also like a very loaded question and kind of jaded and elitist question, because really what I'm asking you is, are you serious about running a business? Or is this a hobby that you're doing to entertain yourself, to enjoy life? And, you know, even going back to the first story about Tyler, right? Yeah. He was happy making three dresses a month. What what more richness can you have than happiness? So that doesn't, I mean, I'll tell you what makes me happy every time I make a deposit at the bank. But he had another way of viewing his happiness, right? So yeah, it's also perception. Perception. And I love how at the end, though, you were like, he still had more to live like he's no it just kills cool. me you want to hear an update about him so yes. he contacted me uh, uh, actually about a year ago now that he wanted to be a swimwear designer i'm like oh my god that's like the hardest <laughs> thing like really like where did we get this from so now he's out there like doing but he ended up moving back to georgia because his grandma that raised him mm -hmm. she's pretty she's pretty old now and, and he came back and and he's still a nurse okay <laughs> Hey, I loved it though. I, I really love like each, like when we talk about like each story in the book, to me, it all had this common theme of experience. And that was either the experience with an individual that you were working with or the experience that you create in your retail establishment with your brand. And I loved how you showed that with each story. And so can you talk a little bit about like, just if you are going to, you know, put your ideas out in the world, what type of experience you need to create so that you are able to be successful? Well, you know, so again, we have to go back to what it does it mean to be successful? Exactly. That's true too. And in and, and perception, you know, I, I work with a lot of moms. So I also want to go on record as saying, I hate the term mompreneur. Like what the hell is that? You're an entrepreneur and then you're a mom or you're a wife or there's no wifepreneur. Like, what does that even mean? Like, to me, it's almost like belittling the role of women. Like, mm. we can do lots of things. We can do and we should be recognized for being who we are. And you know what we are? We're boss. Yeah. 
Wow. So that's, you know, it, it's really funny because years ago, one of the women that I really admired in the industry was uh, Linda Ratchard. And she okay. was, so she started as an assistant designer back in the day of Playtex. And she ended up being the CFO. So what does that tell you? Like the woman knew how to move through the system and grow and like mm -hmm. own it, right? And there was an, a woman, a Women's Wear Daily interview with her. And they said, well, what do you think about like industry peers, meaning guys, what did they think about you? Like, you know, and they always say that you're a bitch. And she sat back in her chair and she says, as long as they spell it with a capital B. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. hey. <laughs> so that's like owning it. Right. And that's what I feel like being successful has to be with what you're comfortable with, what what values you have, what the mission is in life. You know, when I was first in school, it was all about getting the best grade. Right. Because that's what they told us. You had to have the best grades. It, everything was going to go on your permanent record, which I don't even understand what that is. But and then as I got older and I graduated school, it was how much money can you make? Like who's more successful? Like who's got the bigger house? Who's got the fancier car? And then for a moment there, there were all my friends having kids. I don't have any kids, but all these like really powerful successful women became like they would call me on the phone and talk to me and baby talk. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going there. And then what I realized that what you really want in life is to have a legacy, to have something that people can look back and say, this person left this mark. On yeah. Me. Yeah. And that's what you want to be able to do. So then how do we get there? Right. What is our version of success when it comes to all of that? And that is such an individual journey, which, again, me personally, and I'll use this analogy because to me it was the most meaningful one. So I had been going to Peru for like 10 years. I go twice a year. I go for business. I go for sourcing. I absolutely love the country. I love the food. I love everything about it. Uh -huh. But every time I went, people would always ask me the same thing. Like, have you been to Machu Picchu? How can you go to Peru for 10 years and never go to Machu Picchu? So I set out, I think it was like two years ago. I set out that like, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to make an effort. I'm going to stay an extra three days, three days. Right. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to go to Machu Picchu. And it's a journey. You have to like go from Lima to Cusco. You have to acclimate for a couple of days because it's, the altitude is a big deal. Then you have to take a, a minivan to a train stop and then a train mm -hmm. stop like to another van that goes all the way up the hill. And finally, you're at Machu Picchu, right? And the whole time I was doing this journey, I was such a rush to get to freaking Machu Picchu that I didn't enjoy the journey. All the beautiful things in Cusco, all the people in the minivan, the beautiful train ride in the mountains, the little van ride, which is hair raising because it's like on the edge of a road going zigzag up the hill. And finally, when I got there, I was, it, it wasn't, you know, like the minute after you open your last Christmas present, yeah. it was that <laughs> instead of enjoying like the whole month of holidays. So I feel like even though we're frustrated, the production isn't coming out right, an employee let us down, a factory screwed us over. That whole journey, that whole process has to be part of the joy that you feel. If not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to do. And you see, you see that passion you just said, that journey, appreciating that journey, you see it all throughout the book. Like, it's amazing to see. And I love the fact that you talk about, and you mentioned it earlier, but like perceptions. And that was another thing I absolutely loved that it was like, OK, like, for for instance, one of them, every like basic business class that I go to says, you know, the first three years, you're not going to make money. So it's OK. You know what? Yeah. Basically, they in, in some form of words. They yeah, say, yeah, yeah. I've read that, too. The first year the first, you know, and you talk about that in a book. And along with other things like the whole organic movement, the sustainability, the, you know, child labor, like all these different things you talk about that we that is a part of the fashion industry that people don't think about the full story. We just hear part of it. So, you know, if there's anything you want to share about perception, I know you talk about like the whole smoke and mirrors. I know I kind of went around like it's, mo it's so like this book is so juicy like I but you know it. this is the thing like people will they just read like um a headline and then it becomes fact right so mm -hmm. i guess in the last couple of years we're all very familiar with like half truths or like you know fake news or oh, yeah. and it's not necessarily that it's fake it's that it's not the complete story 
So like, I'll just give you like one quick example of like organic cotton. You might be able, and I use the word might very lightly, you might be able to grow cotton organically, but you cannot process it organically. The minute that it gets, and I'll give you a perfect example. So much organic cotton comes from India, which is beautiful cotton. I'm not in no way like dismissing it, but the minute that it gets on a, on a, in a container to be shipped, those containers are fumigated for bugs. So when you fumigate something that might have been organic, it's now actually toxic, but we're still paying organic prices for it. So this is what I'm talking about. Even like we always talk about the Rhonda um, Plaza tragedy, the building in Bangladesh that fell down and they blame like the fashion industry. And I'm like, hold on a second, sister. Like we are not building buildings. Like the people that were inside the plaza could have been canning tuna fish and the building still would have fell. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the the building inspectors, the corrupt government, you know, even when we talk about like fair wages and fair trade and all of this nonsense, like, for example, do you know to be certified as a fair wage company? So if I'm an indigenous person living in the mountains of Guatemala and I want to put a sticker on my stuff that says fairly traded, meaning that you came paid me and I took the money, that sticker costs $5,000 a year that needs to be certified. $5,000 a year. Yeah. is like the education for a whole town for a year. So that's why a lot of things really are fair traded or are, you know what, it's, that's the other thing too, is like wages. Like what they, you know, fair traded doesn't mean that the person is actually making a livable wage. So this is where we have to kind of all dig down. Now, I know it's very overwhelming and you feel like responsible and people are like, I just want to start making things in like my own house. And there's a, a great episode of Portlandia. Did you get to see it? No. Where they have like the accidental sweatshop. Mm -mm. Oh my God. I recommend everybody watch it. It's Portlandia. Okay. It's hilarious where they like, they're two hipsters and they go into a store and they're like, oh, nothing's made in America. And they get a tailor to make a shirt. And by the end of the episode, they have like 20 women sewing in the basement of their house with no air conditioning, no water, no nothing. Little children trying to carry the fabrics. And it was like the accidental sweatshop. And that's exactly what happens. And I feel like sometimes Americans, especially Americans, and, and, and a lot of Europeans too, they put these standards that are not realistic when the fact that I don't have food on my table is a reality every single day in my home. So if I need to bring my daughter with me, because if not, she would be home because there is no school for her to go to, she could be falling into being a victim of the sex uh, trade. And I'm going to tell you, even when I go down to Peru and I'm standing online at customs and I take a look around, because you know, I'm the marshal on the plane, right? That's like my my whole thing too. So I take a look around and I'm sizing people that are gonna go on the plane, right? And I'm like, oh, these people are missionaries and these people are crunchy granola hikers. And what are those two skinheads doing on this line? And I know what they were doing in Peru, right? So I, I try, this is my own like fun. I try to make them as uncomfortable as possible. I can see that. I'm reading a book, I can see you doing it. <laughs> so, for like the designers who, and even retailers, if they're like, well, what's the first step? Like, what is even the first step? I'm overwhelmed, like, what do I do? What would you give them as a, like, maybe first section of steps, if not just a first step? Well, for designers and retailers, it's very different, but, so I'm gonna just probably talk about the designers. Okay. But for the designers, the first step is, and again, it goes opposite of what they taught you in school you know, make beautiful things and people will buy it. It doesn't really work that way. That's a nice hobby, you know, and probably your art belongs in some like museum or some little gallery that you'll have some friends over and have a drink and everybody will say how great you are and that's about it. But my, my idea is that take a look at, even start with the stores that you like to visit, like the boutiques you like to visit. Look inside the stores, you know, visit them virtually, see what's missing, you know, like right now I did this for a client and we realized that there's a huge gap of tween clothing. So I'm giving you like if anybody out there is like looking for like a niche market, tween clothing. So what is that? It's like that mm -hmm. nine to like 14 year old. Okay. That she thinks she's all grown up, right? But mom doesn't think she's all grown up. So there has to be like a middle ground and that age 
you be you can't imagine what an active social life they have like birthday parties are a big deal when they hit 13 in the jewish community they go to like a dozen bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs right mm -hmm. and then at 15 in the latin community it's all about the quinceanera and then they have a dozen parties to go to that and I'm then sure. it's like, like, you did yeah. and then there's like the sweet 16 and then there's graduation and then prom business is a whole other thing but that nine to like 14 year old that niche market that kind of retailer that's an open you know that's really an open market sphere that they're like borrowing from kids or they're borrowing from juniors and it's not necessarily appropriate right okay <laughs> just hear that she gave an idea of a niche that you could potentially explore. But one of the key things also she said is go into these retailers and see what is missing. So see what is missing that will fit what you're doing or like, okay, so now my brain is going. Okay, so even with the chapter about street. <laughs> yeah. Like, I guess, I guess, when we're <laughs> offline, I'm gonna give you her Instagram because to this day, I still cry about it. Mm. I know I went on there. I was like, no, don't do it. I went on like Instagram. I was like, people probably like, what's she talking about? But that's what I was talking about. But like finding a niche, like your customer may be telling you that you want they want this, but then you may ignore it and want to do something else. Like really and she had her own reasons for doing something else, right? Yeah. She just didn't um without giving too much away of the story is that when I analyzed her business, and again, this was one of the designers that I was searching for my own stores and my client stores new product so i found her on instagram i sent her a text message it's one of like those like dating you know catfish things she didn't know who i was i didn't know who she was right and when i met her in person i could realize why she was uncomfortable saying that she was a plus size designer but she wasn't just a plus size designer she had found a niche market which was thick thin so thin waist and a heavy bottom, right? And mm -hmm. if you look at like the black community, the Latin community, a lot of us are shaped that way. So she had won over that community, she was doing well. And you know what, the numbers don't lie. So when I would look at her reports, small, medium, large, extra large, one X, extra large and one X sold out like in hours. Smalls, we always had to mark down. So what did the market tell you? The market is telling you, you have to scale up, you have to go up. And every time we went up, it was like a battle with her and she would fight me and she wouldn't want to do it. And she would like, this is not what I designed, but my strategy for her was right now, you may not be enjoying it. And again, it's perception, but just look at all these beautiful pictures. This one girl, like I still cry about it when I look at the picture, you know, she, she had said that she hadn't been on a date in 10 years because she didn't feel pretty in anything until she wore, remember when uh, Beyonce did the lemonade? Yeah, um, yeah. she had made this lemonade dress that had like off the shoulders. Everybody has a beautiful collarbone, right? You could be as big as a house and have beautiful collarbone. Yeah. So it was like off the shoulder, lemon print with a white background. And she said that she felt like Miss B herself, right? Mm. And she had the courage to actually go out on a date. That is life changing over a freaking $40 dress. Yeah. So yes. for five minutes, she was happy with what she was doing. And then we went back to the constant struggle. But long story short is that when we actually started talking to some investors to like buy the company and whatever, and they gave me that big number and I'm like, you know what, if they're willing to give us $10 million today, yeah, you know what, that's a game changer for her because we needed the money. But if we would have held out another year, it would have been a hundred million dollars. And that's a life changer, not a game changer. But you know, she couldn't wait it out. And so, so you see, like knowing what you want, like, and then in the moment, things may change because you change, but to figure out like what really makes sense, like, because I was like room for, I'm like, hold out, hold out, don't. And then I read the end and, you know, it was over. I know, you know, I still keep that text message, right? Like every time I want to like burn myself up, I'll like look at that, like, <laughs> and, you know, and I described him perfectly. He did look like the Indian Mr. T. So mm, you have to imagine yeah. him, like sitting back in a chair. With oh, his... you know it. You know, but you know that's and you know this is the thing too. So I feel like going back to school too. We're also taught like not to listen to our gut feelings and not to study like people's body language, and we ignore a lot of those things. Like, like for example, we all have that one girlfriend whose husband's been cheating on her for like three years. Everybody knows it except her, right? Yeah. 
but it's not that she didn't know it's that she didn't want to know and that's what happens in business too like and and when we talk about partnerships too like i am not a fan of partners and i feel like partners are a handicap first of all because you can't make the split second decisions that you need to make every single day a million times a day and i feel like people have partners for three reasons one Probably the biggest one is that they're afraid because they don't know what they're doing. So, and misery loves company. So, you know, me and you've been girlfriends for like since high school, we should do a fashion line together. It'd be so much fun. It's not supposed to be fun. It's business. Mm -hmm. The second thing is they don't have enough money. And this is where then you get into a lot of con conflicts because you might've put $10,000. I might've put $10,000. The company is not worth $20,000. The company is worth negative twenty thousand dollars. So right. So how do we like separate that? And then the third reason I feel like people have partners be between money that they don't know what they're doing is fear. Is that they just want somebody to talk to and complain about and bitch with every single night. So I really feel like all those things, money, you save enough money, you outsource it, you max out 10 credit cards, you do what you got to do. You know, fear. You know, I don't know what higher spirit you might belong to, but whatever it is, you're going to be really close to them because in the <laughs> middle of the night, that is the only, you know, person that's going to be listening to you crying, you know, the whole nine yards. And you know what? Listen, I feel like I've had my share of success. I have a comfortable life. I have a good, I have a very, very good life. And you know what? There's still nights when I'm like, really? What the fuck? Like, really? I have to fight another, like, stupid, like, person that showed up overnight and all of a sudden now they're an expert. They worked for like five minutes in their field. They have a blog and now they're like calling themselves an expert and they're gathering up the tribes and they're like singing Kumbaya and the organic cotton feels like that's not how the industry works. You want to know who's a real industry expert. I really feel like today Instagram is my resume. Like where was I last week? What was I doing last week or the week before that a month ago or a year ago? When when do you ever see any of these people in a factory working with indigenous people? Oh, I'm an expert in like fair trade. Really? When's the last time you were in the mountains of Peru sleeping and eating? My favorite story, guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing and I actually like it. So I'm going to try oh, to wow. figure out. Oh, no, it's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. Hey, I'm not going to <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have seen there's some crazy recipes in that book, too. Yes. And I don't want to divert from well, oh my, we had to just talk about it offline about the monkey. Like, Yo, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, wait, can I, I'll tell you a funny. So, for those of you that have read the story or whatever, it's one of my first experiences in China in a very fancy restaurant, and they served monkeys. So, I'm just going to leave it like that. And the person that I was with, I'm still friends with, right? And he is like really the umbrella king. He makes umbrellas for like Walmart, he makes them for Nautica, he makes them for everybody. And when he tells the story, he says that the monkey was actually a giant gorilla and it was yelling at us. I know, right? I'm like, how is that possible? It doesn't even fit on the table. Like, how could, and how could it have been yelling at us? Like, this was a small little monkey. It was sedated, right? right. It was King Kong. Like, and his, but this, this, this also taught me a lesson. When you are a victim, when you are absolutely horrified, when you've had a terrible experience, when you've been violated, your perception of what happened is very it's intensified yeah and i thank god i've had the skill of being able to compartmentize things like things that situations like that i'm able to like shrink them down hide them in a little corner in my brain and never look at them again right mm -hmm. so you know and even going back to like some of the women that i've worked with you know in africa and south africa um the gentleman that i worked with in the congo who was a boy soldier like yeah. These are like, that puts your life in, in perspective. Like I'm pissed off because I got a parking ticket. He's pissed off because his village was burnt down. Like mm -hmm. you have to put things in check. And that also what propels you to move forward without having so much pity for yourself. Well, and there's the other story. Remember the guy that had a meltdown because of the color blue? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm telling you. So, and that's why I called it like Zoolander's a documentary because I promise you in Zoolander 2, that new designer, like it was 100% him. Like somebody went to a bar, hung out with this guy and like mimicked him 100%. Yeah, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the book like, oh my God, like so many other people would appreciate these opportunities. Like, what are you like? <laughs> I know, he's just a nut job. 
Oh my goodness. But if I ever physically wanted to hurt someone, it would have been him. Mm. And you can see throughout the book how you are able to like separate yourself from, you know, those different stories. It was, please get the book. Like, <laughs> we cannot borrow mine because, like I said, <laughs> it is an MBA. Like, she talked about, like, the, I mean, even like values, knowing what you want. Like, I already said that, but values, like basic business skills, um, you know, just, you know, talking about different myths and giving you another perspective to look at. You know, um, there's a chapter about the hiking store that literally walks you through a selling process. Okay. And one of the things that I love, especially with the Indiana Fashion Foundation, we are about like creating these experiences and bringing great quality and then showing everybody that comes in our space why this is important, how we can help them. And then even after that, how we can even help them in the future. And I love like the whole bike part where he, you know, allowed you to like get the items or clothes. So to send you home, got you got, you know, the clothes from there to go on the bike ride like that is customer service and you know what honey if you knew me and you read that you were like uh uh she does not ride a bike like, <laughs> like I, no i did think that much like, like, i love to ride, ride a bike but she's like i'm like she's gonna get on that bike <laughs> especially when that you said you were so close you know you my so idea close. of like an aerobic exercise is like running after a taxi <laughs> i loved it though i loved it i love this book and i still have like 12 or 12 ish more pages to go but i'm gonna finish it because um it's literally helped me along this uh journey too and so mercedes let's talk more about your company you know global purchasing can you talk more about that and exactly like what service you offer you know what that's so boring everything is on the website okay? and everything you know what i i do want to address one more thing that i feel is a question that comes up all the time and i appreciate you um mm -hmm. doing that but that's not what i'm here for today like oh i really God. want to get to some questions that I'm sure some people might have, but I just wanna emphasize one thing too. I get this all the time. I didn't go to fashion school. I didn't go to design school. I'm not even a good artist, you know, or I, you know, I only know how to dress myself. I don't like, I don't like talking to people. I get that one all the time too. And I'm just gonna tell you that it's not really based on education. And this business is so incorporating, like it really accepts everybody from everywhere. And it's not really about what you have done in your past, but where you want to go. So if you're using that, you don't have the right education or you feel you don't have an education, that's just an excuse. And you know what another excuse is that really gets under my skin? When people say, I'm doing my best. You know what that means? It's an excuse. This is you give yourself a break to not having to try harder mm -hmm. or not mastering a skill that I know that you're capable of doing. And I find that you can always do better. Like if you're saying, oh, this is all I got. No, like when you're in the thick of stuff and you got to get things done. It's an, it's an excuse. Things. You yeah. know, there's a TED talk that I don't remember what it's called, but if you Google like blind woman TED talk or whatever, she talks about there's a, she, so she goes to the eye doctor every year to get a checkup or whatever. And the doctor is like talking to her or whatever. And now it's her like 16th birthday. And the doctor says to her, oh, it's your birthday today. What are you going to do? And like she says, oh, my mother got me a, a gift certificate for a, a driving lesson because I'm going to get my driver's license soon. And the mm -hmm. doctor angrily looks at the mother and says, it stops today. You need to tell her. And then like, what? Tell me what? Tell me what? And she's like, you are legally blind. You will never be allowed to drive. But for 16 years. She didn't know because her mother didn't let her use it as a handicap. She just thought that people, that's how everybody looked at the world, like foggy mm -hmm. and shady oh, and no. colors and, right. So since she didn't know what she didn't know, it wasn't part of her like sob story. Mm. So what excuses are you making? Like why is it, why are you not going after these goals that you have, whether it's to have your own retail establishment, whether it's to be a designer, to be in the fashion industry, start thinking about what is holding you back and don't allow it to. And I'm telling you, if you read this book and all the experiences that are in here, it will definitely give you a new perspective on like what's going on in the world, as well as like, like she said, she can, I, I'm like, like you can separate yourself from a lot of things that you talked about in this book. That's amazing to me, like that you can do that. And so 
is thinking about what do you want to do so write in the comments below and then i'm gonna start answering like asking some of the questions i see is 8 22 so i'm gonna get some questions answered uh stephanie wanted to say stephanie williams said hey um Hey Mercedes, it's Stephanie from Roxy Rose in the Lemon Sea Boutique in Indiana. Hey, hey what are you doing? <laughs> I believe, yeah, she told me she had took a workshop or some type of class or something like that. Yeah. And then um, Tiffany asked, what are the first steps to selling wholesale online? So that first of all, that's a really bad idea. It's a, okay. I'm yeah. just gonna go there with that. Um, the customer needs to, um, the customer needs to, so there isn't, I'm just going to be really frank. I love that about you. There isn't an online pure play clothing brand that can be possible, profitable. And I've had this conversation that like people will say, well, what about Nasty Girl? We know what happened to Nasty Girl. Well, what about Everlane? Everlane opened up stores. Well, what about Red the Runway? They opened up stores. Like everybody in the fashion industry has to, open up a, a brick and mortar store because fashion just doesn't sell online. Now to answer your question, Let me know in the comments below if you can see me. I don't know. Hey, this is technology and the computer, uh, it just shut off. So we'll get Mercedes back on. But go ahead and answer, ask questions. It's showing me that I am live. So if you can let me know in the comments below. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Let me know in the comments below. And then we'll get started once she comes back on. But how are you liking it? Let me know in the comments below. There's like so many things that we could share. Um, so this is just like a little taste of it. And I'll, you know, be able to add if you have any other questions that we don't answer. I can maybe see if um, Mercedes can answer them, but we'll see. But let me know in the comments below. Can you hear me? <laughs> Telling them, hey, sometimes, you know, the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, no, no. You're fine. So just to, to say, so if when you're a brand and you want to sell wholesale online, you have to be able to offer the samples to the retailers. So we usually do that through email communications. We usually send a couple of emails. We do them on a service so that we can see who opens it. Then we follow up like, hey, I'd like to send you some of our best sellers. You put it in a box, you make it all nice. You put the line sheets in it. You send it out with a return sticker and they send it back to you. And usually we find that by selling this way, by showing them some samples remotely, you, probably the return rate is like 98% that they mm -hmm. buy something. And the two times, the two reasons why they don't buy something is that when they saw it in person, they actually didn't like it. They didn't like the fabric or whatever, which is why mm -hmm. I tell buyers never to buy online. And the second thing is that I find is that they may have run out of money for that season to buy something, but they want to save the money for you for the following season. Mm. So there has to be a, a continuity involved. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me look and see the next question. Um, mm -mm -mm. Again, as I'm doing this, let me know what city, state, or country you're from. I'm going back and forth from my laptop and in the comments. So definitely add that in the comments below. And then um, let's see. Okay, so I'm in the process now of putting in my photography design on shirts and products. Excellent. She's having problems finding a printer to execute it. So where would she find resources for that? Or just in general, like where would you find resources? Look, I'm gonna tell you something. So with the Rose Hartman t-shirts, which you can look them online, and this is what I do for a living and I'm really, really good at it. It took me a year and five factories for them to print the picture the way that I wanted it. Because mm -hmm. when you silk screen on cotton, when we were, it's a premium shirt, so we were doing it on 100% Pima cotton. And because it's a black and white picture, it's not two color screens, it's like 20 screens. So it has to be a factory that has the machinery that can print one color, dry it, print another shade, dry it, like 50 shades of gray kind of a thing. Okay. And it took a terrific time, but I would say that when you're sourcing a factory like that, Peru is number one, and they do have a trade show once a year. 
um, held in April. Mauricio, is it April or March this year? In April, where you fly down and you meet the factories, you could go to the actual factories and they have like a little trade show and they're the kings when it comes to like printed screen, screened t-shirts. So that's where I would start. Okay. Okay. And then another question that comes through is, um, I have a whole lot of passion, but no money. So, and I know we talked about that a little bit earlier, but I have a whole lot of passion, but no money. How can I do this? So first she's not exactly telling me what she wants to do, but yeah. here's the thing though. You gotta be specific. The people that tell me I have no money, when I look at them, they have like the latest iPhone. They're also wearing like off-white sneakers. They're also like, you know what? You have to learn how to live humbly. You have to have three jobs. You have to really want it. And you know, when you start applying for like, oh, I'm gonna get a small business grant. I'm gonna get like a woman entrepreneur thing. You know what it is? All you're gonna be doing is spending a year of your life, jumping through hoops, filling out forms, you know, filling for all of this crap that at the end of the day, would they give you 50 cents that I'd much rather you would have made like one t-shirt, sold it and I gave it away for marketing reasons at the club, sold it, made $10, that makes you $20, that makes you $40, that makes you $100, that makes you $2,000. And this is what you want to look at. Like, how can I take what I have and double it every time? And again, this is like my most valid advice to you. It's okay to start small. It's not okay to think small. Do you hear that? Say it again. <laughs> it's okay to start small mm -hmm. with one piece of accessory, with three t-shirts, with one dress, hustling as much as you can. But you have to understand that that's not where you're going to stay. It's all about thinking big. Right. And that's, like, like you said, being able to separate the two. Like, and know that. And, I, and that's, to me, that's go. It seems so simple. But that is go to me. Like, so let me know in the comments below if that is resonating with you, if you have any other additional questions. And again, Chronicles of a Fashion Buyer is a great book. Like Mercedes is not telling me to keep saying this. <laughs> no, but and you know what? You could buy it on Amazon. If you it's I'm gonna be honest with you, it's cheaper on Amazon. And if you bump into me at one of the many trade shows that I go to, bring it with you. I'll be happy to sign it for you. Or you could go on my website or my Instagram, Mercedes GPC, and you could click on it there. And I will make sure that I give you this adorable little bookmark. So you don't oh, have one of these. Look, the <laughs> magnet. I think it's adorable anyway. And, um, and I'll sign it for you too. I'll even write what you want me to write in there. That's good. <laughs> so another question that just came through is how do we find mentors in this fashion space? So when you mean by mentor, you mean somebody for free that's going to tell you what to do? So they did not say that, but that is a key thing to add to it. So for me, I would talk about a payment, someone that whether they're paid or not, they will help you. So if you want to talk about so somebody paid. It I think a very valuable tool, but again, you have to, it's funny because you feel like they're interviewing you, but you actually have to interview them. And one of the resources that I go to too is um, SCORE. So it's the Society of Retired Professionals, but you have to make sure that it's somebody industry specific. Like it can't be like, if you're a designer, it can't be like somebody that owned a store 50 years ago. Like it has to be somebody that made sweaters or pants or polyester dresses like my uncle like it has to be pretty industry specific but you know we do have but you have to qualify for it a um an emerging designer program that is four months long and you talk about mba from a book this is like your phd that's what like, and and this is what i say it's unlimited consultation and i feel like it's a very reasonable fee it starts at like four thousand dollars but it's unlimited. It's like going to the gym. You could pay for the gym membership. You could pay for the trainer. But if you don't show up, you're still going to be fat. So you need to be able to like discipline yourself and say from 8 to 10 o'clock every night, this is what I'm working on my side job. I'm working on my hobby. I'm working on my future is what I want you to be doing. And this is when I'm going to send emails to Mercedes or to the company and ask her her advice on this or before I call a factory, like what's the best way to approach and where are my red flags? Like all of those things, every single tiny step, we're here to help you. And so I think that's like, 
so important because I, when I speak to some of the designers, it's like, oh, I don't have the money, but then they spend years investing in different things or, you know, spending money where they really shouldn't have spent money. And when you think about it, you spent way more than that. than if you were to find an expert that you could really trust that's been there, done that, you know, make sure that they're doing what they said they need to do along the way too. But, you know, but I, I told you about the, the client, well, the consultation that we had, they came and she spent $6,000 on a sewing class. I'm like, great. You just learned how to be an employee and not a boss. Like that's not what you want to learn. I don't, I'm very proud to say I cannot sew a button. <laughs> Seriously. And people in my, my office will tell you, never give Mercedes a button to sew because it will come out like the worst cockeyed mess you've ever seen, right? But I know how a button should be sewn and I know what kind of buttons I like and I know how to tell somebody to sew it for the price that I need to pay for it. That's a boss, not a worker. Yeah. Yeah. So you can learn and figure out what you want to do, but you don't have to learn how to sew. Because I, I, I actually teach sewing sometimes. And <laughs> I've told designers, I've said, you don't have to know how to sew, but some of them come. But you have to know, like, to, it's really funny because even people that know how to sew, they don't know the technologies and machineries. They don't know the, the different, like, that's really when people like, oh, they make things cheap in, in China. Yeah, you know why? Because they have robots in the factory. Mm -hmm. They have self-sewing machines. They have cutting systems that are like computer generated, like laser technology. It's insane. And actually, and also the process from a home sewer to actually being in a manufacturer is completely different. Absolutely. So, no, and that's why I don't even like designers to make their own samples because as a buyer, I'm always disappointed at what production looks like because it wasn't made in a production factory. Yeah. Yeah, at quality. Man, there's so many more questions I have for you, but we are going to wrap it up. I'm going yeah. to, I know, right? <laughs> People are like, okay, so we had St. Louis, we had New York, we had Indianapolis, Columbus, um, Los Angeles. You know, thank you so much. If you're watching the replay, definitely add your comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if you want to find out more about Mercedes, Mercedes, can you share your email? And then I'll also add it to the comments in here as well. I'll add your information. But which email would you like for us to use? Not yeah, email. You can just website. which website? Yeah, well, the website is globalpurchasinggroup.com. Um, and you can email me directly. It's Mercedes okay. at Global Purchasing Group. Um, I am pretty responsive when it comes to Instagram. So Mercedes GPC. If you want to follow um, the store that I own, it's uh, Just Shop Boutique. Um, and if you just visit some of our websites and look at our, some of our videos on, on YouTube, and don't forget to buy the book. Yes. I need to be a New York, New York Times bestseller, and the only resources I have are you guys. And look... And like she said in the very beginning, the emerging designers, I have been so many different places and they're not worrying about us. They're not worrying about which is key because, like you said, these boutiques and retailers, they want the new hot stuff. So it makes sense. Like it makes sense. So as you can see that she has a wealth of knowledge and information to share. So like for me, I'm always reaching out. <laughs> So, hey, that's how you, you know, navigate through it. So definitely, you know, the Indiana Fashion Foundation is all about providing resources and opportunities and bringing industry professionals into the platform so that you can learn and grow in this industry and actually be a boss. Like I was in hobby mode, not trying to be for a long time, just because I didn't know. I spent a lot of money. I did a lot of things that, you know, I thought was the right thing that didn't, you know, bootstrap in. And so I really had to turn around by getting with the right people. So and don't think of that you're spending money. Think of it as yeah. investing money. Investment. That's the only you're investing thing. in your future. <laughs> I'm like, this is an investment. You know, my day job, like you talked about in the book, my day job is my investor. Like I switched. That's right. Down. Yeah. So like even you said, don't quit your day job. <laughs> That's number one rule for anything. And even opening a store, you know, I always use the example that Sam Walton worked at Ben Franklin stores when he opened Walmart. Yeah, I, I didn't know about that until I read it in the book. Yeah, yeah. There's so much. Like, you got to get the book. There is so much. Like, again, like I said, 
it will walk you. You really read it like and, and take what she's saying. It's going to walk you through selling processes. It's going to walk you through how to create an experience. It's going to walk you through like how to use other people's experiences to learn from and add them in your, you know, in your own way. And that's me. I love learning from other people. And I hope you can learn from me like things that I've done. So again, Mercedes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> My and pleasure. So yeah, so this was the first series of the Making It In, which N is for I, for Indiana, but the Making It In fashion series. We're going to be bringing you more over the course of the year. The next one will be, we're bringing an um, a industry professional into Indiana. And then Mercedes, I would love to continue to you know network with you and see how we can continue to do some things with the Indiana Fashion Foundation. And so- Is anybody going out to Las Vegas next week? to um, the trade shows, make sure you look me up and say hello and say that you heard this uh, event on Facebook. Oh, I thought I lost you, yeah. <laughs> no, on Facebook for Indiana Fashion Week. Yeah, definitely, definitely let her know. Let her know. And I found like, oh my God, I keep seeing stuff. It's so much stuff, it's so much stuff. But I know in one of the videos you were like, people won't like come up and ask you something. <laughs> I'm like, I'm there. It costs money if you come to my office, but when I'm there, I'll answer you. Well, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So again, if you have not already liked the Indiana Fashion Week, so it's Indiana Fashion Week, like our Facebook page. We're also on Instagram. We are launching the Indiana Fashion Week in June, and we're excited about that because it's all about creating this platform for you to continue to grow, learn, and, you know, like she said, be a be a boss in the industry. And one thing I find out is that, you know, a lot of small cities with, you know, small fashion industries, they're looking for this platform. So we are here and we are excited and we are just appreciative of you. That. So thank you, um, Mercedes. And again, add some more comments below and then we will be watching the replay. So again, this is Delane with Indiana Fashion Week. I'm the executive director and we cannot wait to share more with you. So like us on Facebook and we update like daily of things that's going on. So thank you again, everyone. And bye. <laughs> bye.